out if you've been watching our program, you've seen us take some strong positions on the very sad state of affairs which has plagued the Catholic Church since the Second Vatican Council. But we also would like to present the positive side of the beauty of Catholic teaching. One of our efforts was to begin a series on the Ten Commandments. Today, we'd like to focus on the Fourth Commandment. I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. The Ten Commandments form the basis of the Mosaic Law. One can find them in the 20th chapter of the Book of Exodus. But they re remain just as valid today as they did then. With me are Father William Jenkins, pastor of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus Church in Cleveland, Ohio, and also publisher and editor of the Roman Catholic Magazine, and Father Clarence Kelly, uh, superior of the Society of St. Pius V, a group of traditional Catholic priests who have determined to hold on to the faith of all time. Reverend Fathers, we find in the 20th chapter of the Book of Exodus the fourth commandment, namely, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thou mayest be long lived upon the land which the Lord thy God will give thee. Apparently a very terse statement, but very, very deep and rich in meaning. It is meaning, and very, very rich in meaning, Julius, because it, it shows <coughs> that uh, by honoring one's parents, one will be blessed, uh, even on earth. And, uh, and it's a tremendous promise from God. You know that... Uh, it was with the coming of our Lord that people were first taught to pray to God as their Father. And this was a tremendous, uh, tremendous enlight enlightening view to the people, to, to think of God as their Father. He was their Creator. He who was, uh, you know, the, the Almighty uh, Judge uh, loved them. With the tenderness of a Father was a tremendous uh, breakthrough. And, uh, of course, our Lord also taught that if we, if we were to love his Father as our Father, him by nature, our Father by adoption, uh, that uh, we must also obey him. And so our Lord taught that he himself had come to carry out the will, to do the will of his Father, and we must do that will also. And our Lord told us what that will was. So our Lord did not give us simply a... Uh, a blank check, so to speak. You know, God is your father, here are the car keys, you know, have a nice time. Uh, our Lord taught us that uh, we must be good children adopted by the uh, grace that our Lord won for us through his sacrificial death on the cross, and we must obey his Father's will. Father Kelly. I think the commandment itself tells us something about the inner life of the Blessed Trinity. We know that in God there are three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We know that the eternal Son of God proceeds from the mind of his Father, and that the love between the Father and the Son <coughs> uh, is the Holy Ghost. So we have truly three divine persons in the Blessed Trinity. But the, uh, the Son of God, having become a man, we see in the course of his life that his uh, sacred heart was consumed with love for his Father, so much so that he forgot about uh, rest and he forgot about uh, food. It comes to mind the incident uh, uh, with the woman, at the woman at the well when the apostles and our Lord stopped uh, in Samaria and our Lord went into our Lord stayed by the well, and the apostles went in to get some food. And our Lord then went uh, through this series of questions with this woman to bring about her conversion, which uh, demonstrated his great love for souls. And when the apostles came out, <coughs> they brought food to him. And our Lord was not even thinking about the food. He was thinking about uh, his father. He was consumed with this desire to do his father's will. And the apostles said, well, uh, has someone brought him something to eat? And our Lord said, I have meat of which you know nothing. And my, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. So our Lord is consumed with love for his heavenly Father to do his holy will. And we have in this commandment, this fourth commandment of God, a, uh, an expression uh, and a manifestation of the disposition that a child should have uh, toward his parents, that we should love our parents, we should reverence them and, and respect them and be devoted to them and be concerned for their spiritual and for their temporal welfare. 
We have a natural obligation to respect our parents because they are the principle of our existence. Of course, they brought us into, into existence. But also, uh, they have an obligation before God to raise us well. God endows them with responsibility over us, uh, that is, our parents, principally our father. And uh, because God gives them a responsibility for us, he also gives them authority over us. And the authority that our fathers have over us is not just the authority of nature. You might say, it is the authority of God himself. Uh, God is the source of all authority. And so the child's first confrontation with authority is in the person of his parents. And uh, actually, it is in those earliest days of the child's life when he realizes that there is a will over and above him to which he must answer in, in his parents. That is the beginning of the child's, you might say, moral life in the sense that he, he recognizes his first encounter with authority. And that is going to shape his entire understanding of authority for the rest of his life. Um, the parents' authority over their children is also involved in this fourth commandment. It is not just the obligation of a child to his parents which the fourth commandment deals with. The fourth commandment also implicitly concerns the parent's use of authority for the good of his child. And uh, certainly the modern world could uh, learn a lesson from the, the sense of this fourth commandment today. What, what do you think the relationship is between <clears throat> the exercise of authority of the parent in training the child, and the attitude of the child later on towards the laws of God? Well, I think the, uh, the, the child begins to learn or form a concept of authority from the first moment the child hears the word no and understands what it means. And the child then is going to react either by obeying or disobeying, even though the child may be very small and perhaps the child hasn't even learned to, to walk yet. But uh, as soon as the child hears the word no and understands what it means, the child is either going to obey or he will not. And then the parent has to react accordingly. The parent has said no, and the child defies the parent, however innocently it may, it may be at the time. If the parent does not correct that or does not enforce his no, the child immediately begins to form a concept, however vague it might be, that it doesn't mean anything. So that you think that when the child uh, grows up, as it were, mm -hmm. and he hears about the laws of God, mm -hmm. how those who die in a state of mortal sin will go to hell, and those who die in a state of grace will go to heaven, and if they commit these sins and break these commandments, they will lose their souls, you think they don't take it seriously? I think they won't take it seriously, and I think it's because from the child's earliest years, he was taught not to take authority seriously. It may seem to be stretching the point, but by the time a child reaches the age of reason, at the age of six or seven years today, his habits are already formed. His con concepts are largely formed. And uh, one of the first concepts he's going to be forming is uh, his relationship to the will of his parents and those who are over him, the whole notion of authority. And if he's been taught by his parents' neglect that uh, no doesn't really mean no, that the child uh, can do what he wants, and there's no enforcement of any, any restraints on his own will, that child is going to grow up to be rebellious and completely out of control. So it's very important for the parents to learn to be consistent. That to learn they... to be consistent from the beginning. <clears throat> you know, if, if the first time the, the child hears no and understands it, and he defies it, and nothing is done about it, what happens the second time he hears no? It's, it's already established in his mind that it doesn't mean anything. So the more, the oftener a parent lets it go, the more difficult it is going to be to overcome that, uh, that defiant notion in, the, in even the, the small child, that no doesn't mean no. Okay, so from the point of view of uh, the disciplining of the child, it's very important for the parent to be consistent, Absolutely. and if the parent threatens punishment, then the punishment should be meted out if the law is broken. Right. Okay. On the other side of the, the coin, we have cases, especially today, in which parents go to the other extreme. We have both extremes today, where the children rule the roost, and other cases in which the parents uh, 
literally abuse the children and uh, impose a discipline which is more of violence uh, than it is of reason. So how do you, how do you then balance that? What, what, well, actually, I think it's the, the same. Rule? It's the same mentality behind both of those. The permissive parent can easily be the abusive parent too, because usually the parents who are permissive permit the child to do anything to anyone else as long as it doesn't bother them. Uh, they can do anything to the neighbor's cat they want to, anything to the neighbor's property, or anything to the neighbor. It doesn't matter to them. As long as the child stays out of their own hair, that's a permissive parent. But as soon as the child bothers them, does something that hurts them, they explode. That is the one thing that is intolerable. And they react out of selfishness and can be very brutal to the child, very abusive. So in both extremes, there's a lack of reason. There certainly is. St. John Bosco, uh, who was the, a great priest of the last century, and also the greatest educator of the last century, taught that all disciplinary systems must be based upon uh, reason, religion, and kindness, those three things. He called the system that he, established, that he followed based upon reason, religion, and kindness the preventive system. He said that if you want the child to respect and have reverential fear for your authority, first teach the child to love you, and not by being permissive, but by being love respectable, by being lovable, uh, right? lovable mm -hmm. in the sense that the child can, can find in you something honorable, something decent, and the child will respond to your love for, the, for him by loving you in return. But if you show yourself, as unfortunately so many do today, being very selfish, we, we bring the child into the world, but after that we, we farm the child out to be raised by other people and can't really be bothered with him while we pursue our own careers. You know, the child grows up with the idea that, that he's some sort of a misfit, that uh, he's an accident in the world, and, uh, and he's not really in the world because he's wanted there, but uh, he's some sort of a trinket. Right. Reverend Fathers, what do you think of this tendency, which we've seen for many, many years, but it seems to have come to a head today, to portray parents as foolish, buffoons, clumsy, uh, many of the television programs do this, uh, popular entertainment in general. Uh, what, what would be the attitude toward this? Do you think this is causing a great deal of harm, or is this just good fun? I think it is causing a great deal of harm, and I think it's sort of the, uh, the other side of the attack. The, the attack that we see in the church on the priesthood, on the legitimate authority, for example, of the papacy, this uh, uh, movement to undermine uh, infallible teaching and to deny that a legitimate pope has universal authority over everyone, over every single bishop, every priest, every layperson, that has a counterpart in society as well as in the church, and that is the ruination and destruction of the family. And so how do you destroy, or what is the most effective way to destroy a body? Like, you could harm a person by, uh, you know, causing uh, some type of a wound in their hands or in their legs or in their feet or in their arm or shoulder, whatever the case may be, but the most fatal and effective blow probably is a blow to the head. One swift, decisive blow to the head can accomplish what it might take many blows to other parts of the body. So y you attack the head. You destroy the head, and in that way you destroy the body. So I think that a very, very important part of this is to undermine, to subvert, to destroy, to attack the authority of the parent in the home, to deprive the, uh, the parents of the respect that they need in order to have the rule of reason. We must have the rule of reason, as Father pointed out. Well, Father Kelly religion. was saying so well that the children need consistency, and that's another word for stability. And they need a home, a stable home life. Remember, uh, you know, the, the, the parents are, for the first few years of a child's life, like the child's whole world. And if this is not stable, the child grows up himself being very unstable. If we can get back to the home life after we take our break, you're watching what Catholic beautiful sentiments, and we will do what we can to continue and to send him the catalog of our broadcast. Father Jenkins, I interrupted you while you were talking about the stability of the home. That's a real problem today, the idea of... Uh, of a family with, with our dual parents working, the wife pursuing her career, the husband pursuing his career, 
has almost made uh, uh, anarchy of the family. And in fact, if a woman today, even if she was educated, say, and they said, well, what would you like to do with your career? Well, I'd like to get married and have a family. She'd be looked down upon with contempt as being somehow uh, helpless or very much second rate or someone to be held with a certain amount of contempt. What has this done to the fourth commandment? This whole... Well, if, if you tie it in with what we were speaking about before, why is the parent, for example, portrayed as being whatever, a buffoon or ignorant or some unworthy of contempt? Uh, or what is the effect of it in any case? And it is to undermine the authority which is absolutely necessary for the family unit. You have to have that authority. And as Father Jenkins pointed out before, the authority that a father has comes directly from God. God is the one who gives that authority. And by his authority, he is to impose the laws of God and the rule of love and uh, the principles which are necessary to have a good, a healthy, and, uh, and holy family. Now, the, the head is, is undermined and the body, therefore, is uh, affected. But also, the ideals are subverted. And that, in a certain sense, has a more devastating effect. To portray family life as anything less than noble and, in a certain sense, sublime uh, is, to, uh, is to undermine it because that's what it is. That is what, what God considers to be to be very important. So if you put into the minds of young people that somehow a woman who becomes a vice president in some corporation or the president in a corporation or a successful businesswoman somehow has achieved something, whereas if she simply settled to be a poor wife uh, and mother, uh, that would be a tragedy, you have uh, you have made up and down, up down, black white, white black, right wrong, and wrong right. You've you completely twisted the order of things as it is in reality. The truth of the matter is that a mother, someone uh, who is given a charge over the life of another person to mold and to fashion this creature made in the image and likeness of God, and eventually to succeed and seeing that this child has the crown of eternal life, that is a noble and sublime calling, whereas a woman who merely becomes a vice president of some corporation or president, she, that's a real come down in reality. Now, now people are, uh, are, are, in a certain sense, twisted in their value system. You know, you could conceivably uh, peddle tin as more valuable than gold if you, if you had enough control over the propaganda system of a society, you could have people throwing gold out and, and treasuring tin. And that is really what has happened. So you, you put these ideas in the minds of young people, you destroy uh, the true notion of what family life is and what's really important in this life. And being a mother, being a good wife, being a good homemaker, that is a sublime uh, and lofty calling. There are two uh things which I think, two precepts which I think flow from the fourth commandment implicitly. Number one, the love of country, the respect uh, that one must have for one's country. And number two, the respect for old age, for older people. And they both seem to have very much fallen by the wayside. What precisely is the relationship one should have with regard to one's country, loving one's country, and especially with younger people to older people? Well, it comes under the same virtue, the virtue of piety. And the virtue of piety is that virtue by which we uh, have loyalty and reverence, uh, first of all, to our parents, because they're the principle of our existence, and also to our country, because our country is, in a very real sense, also the principle of our social existence. And because of the virtue of piety, we are to love our country as we love our parents. And by the way, with this tendency in the world now, to, uh, to lessen the loyalty that one has to one's own country and to uh, substitute a loyalty to some international order. New world order. This new world order that we're constantly reading about and that we see editorials in the New York Times about all the time. This coming new world army for this new world order and so forth. That is actually a sin. It is actually a sin against the virtue of piety 
to have a loyalty to an international order and to consider yourself a kind of co citizen of the world with a cosmopolitan mentality. People are given the impression that that somehow is a good thing, but it's actually a sin against why, the virtue of piety. Why is it a sin against the virtue of piety? Because uh, it would be like surrendering your loyalty to your mother and father and substituting instead a loyalty to some collection of, of individuals who have nothing whatsoever to do with your origins, you know? Your mother and father are the principle of your existence. You owe them loyalty and reverence. You don't owe that loyalty and reverence to some group of strangers that arbitrarily comes together and demands loyalty and reverence. So it is also with your country. We are citizens of this country. We owe loyalty, we owe reverence to this country. We don't owe it to the United Nations. You know, what is the United Nations to us? Uh, and that's even if it were good, you know? I mean, if the United Nations were not the, the instrument of the devil as it is and the purveyor of false notions of liberty and eventually, and in, in my opinion, the instrument of uh, an international totalitarian state, even if it were not all those things in reality or potentially all those things, even if it were a good organization, which it is not, you still could not uh, give up your loyalty to your country, which is the principle of your existence, in order to transfer it to some international organization. Father Jenkins, what about the loyal or the, the respect and the honor that is due to older people just by the virtue of the fact that they are older by younger people? This is something which is generally held in contempt today. That's right, it is. <clears throat> it is held in contempt by uh, younger people because youth is glorified as though it were uh, some divine property. And uh, uh, more and more families are taking their older people and putting them off in uh, nursing homes, <coughs> which might be necessary at times when they cannot take care of them. Uh, society is making it necessary for both the man and the wife to work to, to uh, get by economically. So there's no one to take care of the children or the elderly. Uh, but in many cases, the elderly are simply in the way in a family, and so uh, they're simply shunted off somewhere to die, often alone and, and forgotten. It's a terrible tragedy. What should be, though, the relationship, let alone someone who's aged, but someone who's just an adult or older, and say a child, are they equal? Should they, you know, should the child in general refer to someone who's 50 years old by the first name basis? If not, why not? And what governs this? No, the uh, certainly old, older people deserve reverence from the younger, and um, just age itself gives them a title to that. Uh, the years symbolize an increase in wisdom, and uh, they deserve a certain deference. Uh, the younger people should pay them a certain deference. Uh, the palsy wowsy idea now, where everybody is equal, uh, is certainly not the order created by God, but that goes along with the whole notion now that God is just our pal in heaven and, and uh, <clears throat> he has no right really to tell us what to do. We, 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 uh, we appreciate uh, somewhat what he does for us, but there can't be any strings attached to what he does for us. Brother Kelly, what would you say? Uh, I would say that uh, without any question whatsoever, it is in accord with the mind of God that uh, as children reverence and are loyal to their parents, uh, that they should also express a certain reverence to older people. And, and that, by the way, as far as reality is concerned and as far as God is concerned, uh, being a doctor or a lawyer or a businessman and so forth, those are not even considered vocations. Uh, there are three vocations, uh, to the married life, to the single state in the world, and to religious life. And the uh, young women and young men who are called to the married state, that's a true vocation from Almighty God. If you're a good mother and a good wife, a good father, a good husband, then you have uh, come a long, long way to fulfilling the purpose for which God created you. And you should be uh, filled with joy uh, if that is the case. And don't be taken in by this propaganda that is put forth in television and in newspapers that somehow there's anything wrong with being a mother, just being a mother and just being a wife, there's nothing wrong with it. There is something wrong with uh, attaching your happiness to some uh, thing in the world. Which passes in his mere vanity. That's right. right. You've been watching what...